In this video we're going to look at a quick introduction to waves, some of the wave basics, the definitions of a wave and the wordy definitions that you need to know for the exam, as well as a couple of quick and easy practice questions to get you started. So to begin with we need to think about what a wave actually is and it's just a way of transmitting energy from one place to another through a material or in the case of electromagnetic waves through a vacuum but the important thing is you do not transfer matter. Yes, in the case of mechanical waves you have an oscillating particle bashing into the next particle but that particle oscillates on the spot. It doesn't travel from the start to the end of the wave's journey. So there are two main types of wave that we need to know about and these are longitudinal and transverse. Now we're going to start off having a quick look at longitudinal waves and representing it on a slinky, although of course for something like a sound wave you're not looking at oscillating metal in a slinky, you're looking at oscillations of air molecules. So if the hand compresses the slinky, that part of the slinky is going to compress the next part of the slinky which will bash into the next part and you get a compression wave travelling along the slinky where the slinky starts to expand behind the compression wave we call a rarefaction but the important thing is that for longitudinal waves the oscillation of your particles in this case left to right is in the same plane or the same direction as the propagation or the travel of our wave. Now if we have a look at transverse waves in this case here the hand is going to be moving up and down so the oscillation of the particles is going to be at right angles or perpendicular to the propagation direction of the wave. So as the hand moves up and down the individual bits of the slinky oscillate up and down but the wave progresses left to right at right angles to the oscillation of the particles. And so those two definitions are very important. The fact that for a longitudinal wave the oscillation is along the direction of propagation of the wave and for a transverse wave the oscillation is at right angles to the direction of propagation of the wave. Those are two definitions that you need to learn for the exam. And you also need to learn some examples. Examples of longitudinal waves include sound waves and include P waves or the pressure waves that we get from earthquakes. Some examples of transverse waves include electromagnetic waves, the surface of water waves, and you could also include the S waves that we get of earthquakes. All of these waves are called progressive waves because they move in a particular direction. They transfer energy from one point to another, but the particles don't travel with the wave. So in the case of our longitudinal wave, if you look at each individual particle, it oscillates on the spot. It's oscillating in the same direction as the direction of motion of the wave. If we look at our transverse, they're oscillating perpendicular to the propagation or the travel direction of our wave. Now you also need to know some of the definitions of wave properties for the exam. And so if you were to draw a line representing one complete cycle of a wave, so one up to a peak, down to a trough and back to the equilibrium position, this line in the middle, or if you were to draw lines from a peak to a peak or a trough to a trough, or in fact any two adjacent parts of the wave with the same phase, that's your wavelength. Now how far away a particle is from this equilibrium position is called its displacement and the furthest distance it can get from the equilibrium position is its amplitude or another way of thinking about it is the amplitude is the point of maximum displacement. Now the number of full waves you get going past a particular point per second is the frequency and the time it takes for one full oscillation or one full wave to occur is called the period. Now if we know that the frequency is the number of waves per second and the period which we represent with a capital T is the time for one complete cycle or one full wave 
then we can link those two values together using the formula that frequency is equal to 1 over the period t of your wave. So the number of waves you get passing a point per second is 1 divided by the time it takes for a full wave to occur. And again, that's a very important equation that comes up quite a lot for one mark answers. And if you're looking at a longitudinal wave, we can represent the same issues. Our wavelength is the distance from a compression to a compression or a rarefaction to a rarefaction. So those definitions, and again you need to learn these, the displacement is the distance at any given moment from the equilibrium position, that line in the middle. The amplitude is the maximum displacement from its equilibrium position. So remember we're going from the centre line to a peak, not from a peak to a trough. The wavelength is the distance between any two points on adjacent cycles that are in phase, but it's easier to remember it as the distance between adjacent peaks or adjacent, adjacent troughs. You can also think of it as the length of one full wave, but for the sake of an exam, say that it's the distance between a peak to a peak or a trough to a trough. The frequency measured in hertz is the number of waves passing a given point every second. And the period is the time it takes for one complete oscillation or one complete wave to occur. Since frequency is the reciprocal of period, we can say that the frequency is 1 over time or over the period. And again, that equation does come up quite a lot. But the big equation that comes up is the wave equation. Now, I know we've done this to death, but do not forget this equation. It crops up again and again throughout the waves topic. And it is, of course, that the velocity of the wave, usually given to you, although in the case of electromagnetic waves, you're expected to use the fact that the speed of light is 3 times 10 to the 8 meters per second. But the velocity is equal to the frequency times the wavelength. So let's put all this together with a couple of example questions then. To start off with, a simple one involving the wave equation and rearranging, we're given the frequency of a light being 1.3 times 10 to the 14 hertz and we know that since it's an EM wave it has a velocity of 3 times 10 to the 8 meters per second. Now if we take our wave equation V equals F lambda and we're being asked to find out what the wavelength is all we need to do is to rearrange the equation so lambda is V over F and plug our numbers from above into that equation. So V is 3 times 10 to the 8, frequency is 1.3 times 10 to the 14 hertz. Plop that into our calculator and we end up coming up with an answer of 2.3 times 10 to the minus 6 meters. Not too difficult, but again, it does involve you remembering how to rearrange the wave equation. This one is looking at the relationship between the frequency and the wavelength, assuming that the speed remains constant. So, if we draw out the situation, let's imagine a wave with a relatively low frequency. Now, if you have a low frequency, or not very many full waves going past a point per second, that means you're going to have quite a long wavelength. So the smaller the frequency is, the bigger your lambda, your wavelength, will be. Conversely, if we have a wave with a much bigger frequency, more waves passing a point per second, the only way that can happen is for it to have a much smaller wavelength. So the bigger the frequency, the smaller the wavelength. But let's mathematically analyse this. Using our good old friend the wave equation, we know that V is equal to F lambda. But the question says that V is remaining constant. Now if V is constant, you can see that if we increase the frequency, 
we have to decrease the wavelength or frequency is inversely proportional to the wavelength. Since this is the case, if we double the frequency or increase it by a factor of two, then we're going to halve the wavelength because it becomes a factor of one over two. In this question here, you're looking at a periodic disturbance in a lake. So basically, you're looking at an oscillation that is creating water waves or ripple waves around the oscillating point. So it's oscillating up and down. And if you imagine ripples in a pond, you end up getting circular. Admittedly, these aren't the best circles in the world, but you get the idea. Circular wave fronts of peaks emanating outward from our oscillation. Now the distance between two peaks on a ripple tank is the wavelength. And we're told that the speed of the wave in water is 5 meters per second and the frequency is 2 hertz. Can you see where this is going? Yep, using the wave equation V equals F lambda, we know that the <coughs> wavelength is going to be wave velocity divided by frequency, both of which we are given above. And so when we plug our numbers of 5 meters per second for the velocity and 2 hertz for the frequency, we end up getting a wavelength of 2.5 meters. Now, <coughs> the final one is just going to show that sometimes they like to trip you up and give you a question that looks a lot more easy than it actually, that looks a lot more harder even than it actually is. So in this situation here, you know that you've got a boy standing in front of a wall. Doesn't tell you how far away it is, that's what we have to find out. And he yells at the wall. So his yelling creates disturbance. Those oscillations propagate towards the wall. They get reflected and they come back. This is how an echo works. Now we know that the time it takes for that sound wave to get to the wall and back again is 1.2 seconds. But we want to know how far away the wall is. So we need to know the time it takes for that sound wave just to reach the wall. And that'll be half the total time, which is 0.6 seconds. So now we have a time, and for once we're not using the wave equation. For once we are using the simplified speed is equal to distance over time. And we can of course rearrange that to get distance is equal to speed times time. Now we know that the speed of the wave is 340 meters per second. The time it takes to get to the wall is half the total time, which is 0 0.6 seconds. And once again, when we plug those numbers in, we get a result of 240 meters per second. Sorry, meters, it's just distance we're looking for here. So, that's a nice simple question, but it goes to show that you do need to remember your basics. I want you now to work through the past paper questions on the wave basics, look at your worked answers, and if you have any questions, let me know.